when you start creating programs, I try to teach all of my students that the correct process is ready, aim, fire. Unfortunately, my students don't like to do this. They like to do ready and fire, and they skip the aim. In programming, ready is gathering requirements. And they're typically given to you by your organization, by your boss, by your client. But sometimes you have to figure them out for yourself. And I'll come back to that in a second. Aim is to plan. We usually do this doing pseudocode or using unified modeling language. Your plan is like your blueprint for building a house. You might be able to do something simple like a bird feeder or a dog house without planning, especially if you've done it before. But if you're doing something complex, you want to know how much wood you're going to need, what you're going to have to measure it to, what the measurements are, and all the different things that you're going to need before you ever start building that thing. Fire is programming. The hardest part when you're an actual programmer is typically this stage. The hardest part as a programming student is this stage. Because for a programming student, what we're going to give you is word problems. And the hardest thing most beginning programmers have a time with is turning this into logic, programming logic. And so we're going to spend a lot of time looking at how to take a word problem, break it down, and turn it into logic that we can then use. When I was actually programming in the workforce, the hardest thing I had to do was get the requirements. Because we're going to tell you what you need. And you should be able to read it and figure out what variables you need, what you're going to need to do. When I was in the workforce, I was given a problem that I had to create a programming solution for. And it took me weeks to get this far. And that's where systems analysis and design is the bigger picture. Programming is part of it. What I had to do was actually job shadow, learn a job inside out, and then program it. I had to write custom billing for one of our largest customers. At the time that I was given that assignment, we had a secretary who was doing it all in Excel by hand. I actually had to follow, shadow what she did, do it so that I could understand it, make sure I got it right, and then I had to go and program it, and then for two weeks, she, I did it with the new program, and she did it in Excel, and we made sure everything matched before I put it online. So in the real world, that's the hardest part. What you're going to struggle with the most, probably, is taking the word problems and turning them into computer logic. The programming part is actually pretty straightforward. Though programming, once you've written a program, you're going to have to come back if it's in the live and it's being worked on and it's out there for years, you're probably going to have to come back and modify it over time. So one of the things you want to do is document it clearly, because if you come back in six months or a year, or somebody else comes back to make changes to it, they need to know how the program works and how to change things. And that comes down to a lot of how we're using our variables and our programming structures and naming things correctly and using comments, which I'll talk about in just a second. Whenever you start writing a program, or even just converting a problem that was given to you into a program, there are going to be three basic areas that you work with. You're going to have some sort of data. And data can come from multiple places. In beginning programming, we will either just simply assign values, things like pi, 3.14. We're not going to have to get that from the user. We know what it is. We know what the months are in a year. So we may simply assign data, and we may get input or we could read it from a file. Because running a program without data is pretty much pointless. Our very first program is going to be taking a poem or a song and creating a Mad Libs program type program from it, where we remove some words, introduce some variables. And when we have these sort of things, including this one, that we will put them in as variables. Variables are really important in programming. Variables are what hold our data 
so that we can reference them, and it's called a variable because they vary. When I'm thinking about variables, I like to explain this like a post office box. If you go to a post office box and you have your post office box and your key, you know the number of your box. And each time you go to it, you're going to have something different in there. It's going to be mail every time, but maybe you won the publisher clearing, publisher's clearing sweepstakes. Maybe you have your electric bill. Maybe you have a catalog to your favorite clothing store. So the post office box will hold mail and you know what it's going to hold, but the contents vary each time. And our variables are like that. So when we create a variable, it's going to hold different types of data. And the data should be the same every time that we work with it. In Python, we use three primary types of data. Now, Python is a loosely typed language, which means we just created a, a variable and we store stuff in it. Python knows what kind of variable it is by what we put in it. And we can write over it and put new stuff in and change it. Some programming languages, like uh, Java or C++, you have to tell the computer what it's going to hold. There are advantages and disadvantages to that. It can be a little slower to write, but it helps avoid some errors by trying to add text. You don't want to add the works, words hello and world unless you're doing a special type of string manipulation. So variable data types. We're usually going to be working with integers, which we refer to as ints. Those are whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 42. We might be working with um, floating point numbers, which we refer, usually refer to as a float. And all that means is that there's a decimal point. It will allow us to have different levels of precision on either side of the decimal point. And then we would also end up with a string. A string is literally a string of characters. It's usually encased in either single or double quotes. Those can be interchangeable. And it can hold things like spaces, numbers, symbols, letters. And all of the, those things can be stored. Everything actually boils down underneath all of this to binary code. Binary code comes back from the days when computers first started. The first computers were larger than a classroom and, could, and the processing was done and everything was done using vacuum tubes, which had two states, off and on. In programming, that's referred to as binary. And the two states are 0 and 1. And for each character, you need eight bits, which is a zero or one, which becomes a byte. One byte holds one character. There's another, and this is for your Trivial Pursuit game, if you have something that's four bytes, it's a nibble. I've never seen that used other than possibly for a trivia game for Super Geeks. Um, other things for your trivia game, when we fix a program by pulling it apart and solving problems with it, that's said to be debugging the code. That's because the very first bug was a moth that landed on a vacuum tube and shorted it out. We'll talk about that more in just a second. We've come a lot of, long way in actually writing computer code. Originally, computer code had to be written for the specific type of computer you're on using that computer's own machine language. That was incredibly inefficient and not a good way to do things because you'd have to rewrite the same code if you had different locations using different computers for lots of different things. The first solution to that was to come up with a programming language, which was English-like, and the first one was COBOL. COBOL stands for Common Business Oriented Language. It's actually one of the first few languages that I learned. And COBOL was a huge step forward because you could write the program once, and as long as that there was a compiler which would translate your programming language into the local machine code, you could write it once and run it on any type of machine. And that was a huge step forward in programming. When we first started with programming, computers were very expensive and programmers were very cheap. And we would do things using, when I learned BASIC back in high school, junior high, 
we were typically doing things with line numbers. And we would use go to statements to control the flow of logic. So if you wrote something, and this would be print, and then you could put in a word. I don't remember if we had to use quotes or not. And then we would use go to. And we would get this loop. It would come here, it would drop down, and it would endlessly loop and put hello next to itself over and over on the screen until somebody came and physically interrupted it. As we moved forward in programming, we, became, we started to evolve theories and better processes for programming, and we got into procedural go-to list programming. And there are a few basic procedures that we can solve any programming, with, uh, any programming problem with. With three basic programming structures, we can solve almost any problem. And our structures are sequence, where we do things one after another just in a row. We have a decision statement, typically an if statement. And I'll talk about that in a second. And we have looping. So decision statements are usually an if statement. So we make these decisions all the time. When we're deciding what to wear for the day, we would either check what the weather is, look out the window, something like that, and we'd make decisions. If it's raining, we're probably going to take an umbrella, wear something different than if it's 95 and sunny. So we're making decisions all day long. Our programming language needs to make decisions too. And it's usually done using an if-then statement. So if this, then this. And then we have looping. There are multiple types of looping, but looping keeps doing something until a condition changes and it's forced to stop. Read in entries from the file until the end of file is reached. These are our normal processes. And th by doing this, we got into procedural programming and out of the go-to type spaghetti code that sent you all over the place. When we're planning a program, there are two common ways of planning procedural programming. Procedural programming is usually planned using pseudocode and flowcharts. And we'll get more into both of those. I like both of those. I generally prefer pseudocode. And this is stuff that you are generally doing for yourself. It's to help you plan. When you're planning your program, I like to tell my students to read the problem that was assigned to them. And it's usually basically a word problem. And they're going to look for three basic components and organize them. They're going to have to have data, which they're either assigning from the beginning, getting from the user, getting from a file. They're going to do something with that data. So they're going to process it. And they're going to need to list the steps, um, the calculations. And then they're going to have to do something for output. And output has some processing in it often, because you may need to format things, tell it how many decimal points, things like that. But you start looking for, what's my data? Then you figure out, what do I have to do with that data? And then you figure out where you're going to send the results. And so as we're talking about breaking your logic down and turning it into a program, you're going to be creating mostly pseudocode for me, but we will be working with flowcharts a little bit, reading them more than writing them. And before you hand in your programs, you'll need to hand in logic. Once you've handed in the logic, you'll be able to see my logic and the explanation of it before you go into writing your code, so you can compare and make sure that you came up with the same logic that I did. This is the part where most students struggle. If you can figure out the logic, then you're going to be in good shape to go on ahead and write your program. The most time consuming part of writing your program is finding and solving your errors. The most important thing you can do to make this easier for yourself is to program incrementally. Do something and test. Do something and test. I like to write four or five lines of code, everything that belongs together, run the program, make sure that it works. And there's two primary types of errors that you're going to get. You're going to get syntax errors which are caught by the compiler. They're like your grammatical errors on an English paper. You could have something spelled wrong. You could have it indent indented incorrectly. You could have it punctuated wrong. Those are all common syntax errors typically caught by the compiler. In Python, you should be able to find and solve all of the syntax errors simply by looking at your code, because we will get 
little squiggly lines under the code. And if everything's good, we'll get a green checkbox in the top right hand corner of our screen. And you want that because it, often, if you have syntax errors, the program won't even run. The harder thing to find is a logic error. So a logic error would be that you have an employee who's working 40 hours and his pay rate is $20 an hour. And for some reason, when you pay into his paycheck, you get a paycheck of $900,000. Great for the employee, but we want to check for errors like that. So you don't get the result that you're expecting. That is a logic error. And you're going to have to do lots of testing with these. The worst syntax error I ever had, and the most important thing that I've learned in programming, and this was back when I was in college and I was studying Java. I was having a very bad day programming. I'd written an entire program. It had 99 errors. It had 99 errors because that was the most that Java would show me at the time. I was doing this in DOS, dead operating system, the disk operating system, black computer screen, green lettering. It was painful. And I was looking through my code, trying to find the errors, and the compilers weren't very good back then. After looking at it for several hours, I sent it to a friend of mine. And this is a good practice. Have somebody else look at your code, because at some point you can't see it anymore. And he shot back an answer about five minutes later, hey, you're missing a semicolon on line 37, or something like that. From the semicolon, everything worked. What I've learned is that if you break things down into small parts and test them, that finding an error in five lines of code is significantly easier than finding an error in 100 lines of code. It's looking for a needle in a few pieces of hay versus looking for a needle in a haystack. So that's your basic introduction to the overview of programming. Next week, next lesson, we're going to get started with writing our first Python programs.